results were nothing less than phenomenal. Within hours, over 500,000 systems cleared the shelves. When you think of the world's greatest 3D platformers, for the most part, you think of Mario 64. But of course, as we all know, it goes a lot further than that. Crash Bandicoot, Pandemonium, Klonoa. Is Beautiful Joe a 3D platformer? Not really. All of these games did the same thing. They felt like the natural progression from the days of classic 2D platformers such as Ghouls and Ghosts, Rystar, Earthworm Jim, and of course Strider. These were the games that I played the most in the early 90s, besides the obvious. But as we moved into the later part of the 90s, those 2.5D or linear 3D games felt like the perfect progression moving forward. Why? Because game developers were all playing catch up to the mighty Nintendo. Personally, at the time I didn't own a Nintendo 64, I made do with what I had. Games like MDK, Croc and even Tomb Raider I suppose, bless them, tried their best. But for me, true 3D platforming didn't really hit home until after the millennium, when Naughty Dog moved away from the tunnel vision gameplay that was Crash Bandicoot and created what is in my opinion the greatest 3D platformer of the sixth generation. And today, I plan to chat about that game series in Jack and Daxter – The Complete History, where we'll be looking at the game's development, its origin, its sequels, its spin-offs, and of course, its possible future. Welcome to Slope's Game Room. Technically, this was a much, much more challenging project, and so uh, just getting it to run at all was almost a miracle. Our story starts back in 1999. Developer Naughty Dog had already released the incredible OG Crash Bandicoot trilogy, and of course, Project X, aka Crash Team Racing, was to be released later that same year. Up to this point, besides the occasional handheld game, Crash Bandicoot was completely exclusive to Sony. However, over the next few years, Crash would slowly dwindle down in popularity as he was plastered about onto pretty much every other platform you can imagine, releasing games that in some cases were very good and in other cases were laughably forgettable. Even as a young teenage lad at the time without access to the internet, I could see that these games were not created by the original team. Sure, they had love and passion, there's no denying that. But the original vision from the original team, however that may have looked by this point, was definitely not happening with these games. Why? Because Universal Interactive Studios technically owned the name. Sure, it was on a Sony system, and Sony had of course signed the agreement to have the games on their system as exclusives, but that's as far as that deal went. And by 1999, as much as it pains the higher-ups at Naughty Dog, it was time to move on. Our relationship with Universal had gotten to the point where we couldn't continue to make Crash Bandicoot games, although we loved Crash Bandicoot and we loved working with Sony. It didn't make any financial sense. Universal owned the IP and there was a hostility there that was just brutal. So as the team looked at whatever they could do next, one thing was for sure, whatever that new thing was, it wasn't going to be on the original PlayStation. They had already pushed that sexy grey triangle to its absolute limits, looking at the animations and the sheer amount on screen between Crash Bandicoot 1 to Crash Bandicoot 3 shows that they simply couldn't do much more with the hardware. Thankfully, Sony had already been shouting out about the upcoming PlayStation 2 during the production of Crash Bandicoot 3. And because of this, Jason Rubin went into work, went straight up to his small group of game testers and offered one of them an all expenses paid 48 hour round trip to Japan to pick up an EB-1000, aka the first of Sony's PlayStation 2 development kits. Why? Well, the Sony PlayStation 2 was so powerful for the time that you simply just couldn't import it. Sony, of course, wanted to make sure that Naughty Dog were one of the first people to get one of these pieces of kit, but getting it to them was not easy. 
I think because of the success of Crash, they wanted us to get the earliest prototype PS2 hardware they could. At the time, they couldn't even import the machines. It couldn't get through customs. It was this supercomputer. It had to be searched and made sure that you're not using it for nefarious purposes or something. They actually had to sneak it in. They sent us to the airport and we had to drive over into some weird warehouse and pick it up and take it back to the office. Finally, the team was able to mess around with the next generation hardware. Well, some of them at least, as Jason continued to finalize Crash Team Racing with the majority of Naughty Dog, two other members decided to get to work on whatever the next game will be for the PlayStation 2, better known then as Project Y. Of course, after working on so many Crash Bandicoot games over the last half a decade, the plan was to continue on that same 3D platforming path. However, where Crash's rather odd running away from the camera direction was really only made because of the PlayStation's limited hardware, the team knew that they wanted to turn whatever this Crash successor was into a more open world 3D platformer that completely eliminated load times. In all honesty, this non-linear 3D platforming game was pretty much the dream from the get-go, and when Crash Bandicoot was first shown off at CES in 1995, it had some pretty legendary competition. And no, I'm not talking about Bubsy 3D, I'm talking about Mario 64. I think it's fair to say that for the time within the world of 3D platformers, Mario 64 reigned supreme, and even though plenty of games came along to tackle that true 3D style, Crash Bandicoot was its own thing entirely. But now, with the PlayStation 2, Naughty Dog could create a game that could not only compete, but possibly surpass that legendary title. In order to achieve this rather lofty goal, the team started toying around with brand new ideas, including a day and night cycle too. The developers got to work constantly pushing the new hardware to achieve these goals, as well as a few back-end processes that would vastly speed up the development time too, giving them the the ability to upgrade the game on the fly almost instantaneously. And not to skip ahead too much here, but the more recently discovered debug mode in that original Jack and Daxter game is definitely worth looking up if you're interested because it really does show off how advanced this game engine was for 2000 standards. Anyway, they knew what they wanted to do, but they still needed to work out what this Crash successor, or even that big open seamless world for that matter, would even look or feel like. Every single person at the company that could draw physically or digitally was given the opportunity to bring ideas to the table on what that world and its inhabitants would look like. And as the fantasy world look of the game was agreed upon, taking heavy inspiration from the village found in Asterix and Obelix, the characters began to take shape. Originally, Jack, who went under several different names and designs, including a triple ponytailed individual that would show off PlayStation 2's wavy chain physics, at one point had a far more animalistic look. Charles Zimbalis was the guy involved with creating this awesome character, already known by this point as one of the designers on both Crash and Spyro. The original look gave a more Thundercats vibe about him before being redesigned into the more elfish look to suit the ever-growing fantasy layout thanks to some rather incredible tweaks by Bob Ruffay. And finally, it was Josh Scher who was responsible for the name Jack with its South African heritage. One thing that wasn't in place when I arrived were the characters' names. All the art everywhere just said hero and sidekick. In terms of directive, one thing we were trying to do internally was that we wanted to create a title that not only had broad appeal to many different age groups, but also to many different cultures. To that end, that's where a lot of the anime stylings of the characters were coming into play. All of this was done, of course, in order to bring in more Japanese gamers. Titles such as Final Fantasy inspired Naughty Dog due to their worldwide appeal and they wanted this next game to appeal to Eastern gamers more than their previous Crash Bandicoot series had done. And of course, Daxter went through similar changes too on the lead up to his development. Starting off as a more dog-like character before changing into a monkey-like character before finally becoming an Otzel, which is a blend between an otter and a weasel. 
And before you ask, he has absolutely nothing to do with Timon from The Lion King, which I'm sure plenty of people drew comparisons to. Although... Daxter's voice is done by the guy who played Timon in the Lion King Broadway for the first year. The character inspiration was more Joe Matarera, who did Battle Chasers, the comic book, and Miyazaki-san, who does Princess Mononoke. It's also worth noting that his animation style was heavily influenced by Abu from Disney's Aladdin. On top of that, a third character was also intended from the get-go in the very early stages of this game's development, that being a dog-like character possibly taking inspiration from those Charles Zimbalas drawings. This character would have been melded based on the way you play the game, kind of like a Tamagotchi. Of course, this never came to be as it was agreed that the majority of effort really should be put onto the two main characters instead. And having a character like this would complicate a lot of the game's mechanics and story. So yeah, Jack and Daxter was quite far removed from the game that we eventually got. When they brought on Charles Imbalas to create some of the designs for the team to work from, very little direction was actually given. The higher-ups knew what type of game they wanted to make, that being an open-world 3D platforming game, but that's about it. This game was very much a team effort, more so than most platformers that you may be accustomed to. It's funny, for Jack and Daxter, it was always Jack and Daxter. The character hadn't been completely locked in, the design, the ears, things like that. But in my recollection, Jason and Andy, they always knew. Everybody knew. They wanted to do a third-person, open-world action-adventure game that's entirely character-based. This is what they wanted. It was never something that they wavered from. As time moved on and Crash Team Racing was finally released, the team of two working on Project Y grew to 35 by the beginning of the year 2000. Originally, the plan was to get a game out only six months after the release of Crash Team Racing. However, with this new PlayStation 2 hardware, it was quickly apparent that in order to create a heavily story-driven open-world game with absolutely no loading times after that title screen, that it was going to be a multi-year project. The biggest and most impressive game Naughty Dog had ever made up to this point. And it was no easy task. Moving into that second year of development, the game was simply just not fun to play. According to the devs, it was slow, it was buggy, and the world was really too big to know what to do with. The whole thing was a mess. But thankfully, similar to Crash's powerful Ghoul programming language, which was used to create the game, this new game had something even better. Game Oriented Assembly Lisp, or Gold for short, this was the updated programming language created by Andy Gavin and tweaked by the rest of the Jack and Daxter team. And although it was a seriously tough piece of software to use, they did eventually manage to iron out those technical bugs using Goal. And as for those massive open world areas with very little to do, well, they actually managed to fix that with the story. This was the first attempt to introduce more of a story into the games. The Crash games had stories, but they were fairly simple, shall we say. So-and-so has been kidnapped. Dr. So-and-so had done this again. Save girl or save world. That kind of thing. We wanted to try to get a more interesting mythos developed, with the precursors in the world and the echo and everything like that. To do that, the powers that be decided that they wanted to use cutscenes. The more they refined the gameplay, the more they added to the world, the more story that was given to all of the characters in and out of those cutscenes, the more the game felt alive because of it. Jack and Daxter was finally becoming the ultimate Naughty Dog game, a game they always wanted to create since the beginning, a game that could finally take on what was being done on the N64 and in 2001, finally. A game that was released to pretty much nothing but critical acclaim. In the game, you play as both Jack and Daxter, kind of. You see, Jack is really the only true playable character as Daxter really just hangs on your shoulders, essentially being the comedy relief in the game's story. Plus, Jack doesn't talk. He's completely mute in this game. So depending on how you feel about listening to an overexcited man-child injected with Jim Carrey serum, butting in all the way through this game, your enjoyment in the story may vary. 
Regardless, as Jack, you have a whole heap of abilities from the get-go, including the double jump, roll jumps, uppercuts, spinny crash-like attack move. And let me tell you guys, 20 years on, this action collectible platforming adventure game still feels and looks pretty fantastic. Although with it being over 20 years old, you will of course be battling with the standard early 2000s platforming camera issues from time to time. Still none of that really takes away from the game as it's an absolute joy to play. For me, Naughty Dog completely revolutionized the reason as to why you're doing all of the stuff you're actually doing in the game. Rather than just get the red coins or the star at the end of the stage in Jack and Daxter, everything has meaning. And more often than not, you will have endless amounts of missions going on at once because each little fetch quest encourages you to venture out further and further into the world, exploring what the game truly has to offer. And again, because the game has no loading, it really is easy easy to completely lose track of time as you venture out as far as the eye can see, which is actually quite far away. Seriously, you've got no fog up in here. The more you discover, the more you're rewarded with vehicles and extra power-ups for me, not to ruin the sequels, but this original game is really the whole package. Its story is simple enough to please all ages, it has, for the most part, a very typical platforming colour scheme, and it doesn't do anything more than that, which is great. And for those of you that want to play Jack and Daxter yourself, you can do that very thing on your PlayStation 5. This is what I recently did. No, not by using the original discs, but by downloading them. And by the way, they'll soon be available as part of the new PlayStation Plus service too. Thankfully, WD Black are sponsoring this video and they've just sent me a one terabyte WD Black SN850 NVMe SSD for use in my PlayStation 5. And the process of installing one of these SSDs is really not complicated at all. Sony even created an overly detailed video showcasing how to do that very thing and voila, it's as easy as that. Seriously guys, if I can do it, you can definitely do it. The only real issue is what SSD do you buy? Now, of course, I'm gonna be suggesting the WD Black SNA50 NVMe SSD today. Don't worry about searching for it. There's an affiliate link down below. And no, I'm not just saying that because I'm sponsored. Well, I kind of am. But I've actually been using Western Digital SSDs for years. Look, I've even got one here in my editing PC. The real reason I'm going to be suggesting this SSD is because it has a PCIe Gen 4 technology which doubles the transfer rate of the previous Gen 3 tech. It has a read speed of 7,000 megabytes per second and a write speed of 5,300 megabytes per second, which is significantly faster than even PlayStation's default SSD speeds. I, of course, have the one terabyte model. Again, that's bigger than the PlayStation 5's own internal storage, but 500 gigabytes and two terabyte models are also available. And the most important thing about this is that the SN850 has a purpose-built heatsink already installed. This is here to keep the SSD cool, stopping overheating, and of course, it eliminates the hassle of adding one yourself. It's plug and play, so all you gotta do is slot it in, and you're good to go. Some PlayStation 5 games are clocking in 150 gigabytes or more, and with an internal storage space of 667 gigabytes, you do the math. Use the link below, get yourself a brand new SSD, and support the show at the same time. Thank you WD Black for sponsoring this video, but now, let's continue on with the video. Jack and Daxter have arrived and need your help. Toonami's giving you the chance to join in the adventure. We're giving away 20 PlayStation 2s and 500 copies of Jack and Daxter, the Precursor Legacy. Rated E for everyone. Get ready to ride, jump, and race through 12 huge levels in the next generation of platforming adventure. There you have it. Just watch Toonami today from 5 to 7 for the toll-free number. I remember that day. 32 against two. Um, slow day for yours truly. <laughs> I'll let Jack handle these lurkers. <laughs> oh, once in a while I throw him a bone. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I let him have these ones too. <laughs> he's He's been a little rusty, so I... Uh... Hi, Jack. Hey. <laughs> I was just talking about you. A new legacy is born. Rated E for everyone. You think you have it rough? Ever try fighting a dozen lurkers at once? Those guys make purse snatches seem like Boy Scouts. You fight any 300-foot robots today? Uh-huh. <laughs> Didn't think so. It looks like your partner's doing all the work. Maybe it looks that way to the untrained eye. Huh? Hey, 
Hey, big guy. <laughs> Been there long? A new legacy is born. Ready for everyone. <laughs> The amount of effort put in here is undeniable. The animations of the characters and the world around them were simply uncomparable to anything that was available at the time, and even to this day in some instances. The way Jack moves in shallow water and the way the characters stretch and squeeze their facial expressions in and out of the cutscenes still to this day blows my mind. It's a huge step up, but still noticeable step forward from the Crash Days. Jack and Daxter really is a joy to play through once again, collecting all of the power cells, taking in the hugely vast open worlds that all look quite a bit different to one another. It's a game I come back to every few years or so, it's a game that's available several different ways including as a downloadable title for the PlayStation 4 and of course the PlayStation 5. Just make sure to stay clear of the PlayStation Vita version which is quite honestly an embarrassing port of these original games. If you want a good place to start then you absolutely must go back to the beginning and follow the story through to the later games if you wish to go that far that is. Whilst researching and playing through the games again I noticed a few cool little tidbits that I hadn't noticed before. I already mentioned the fact that this game has absolutely no loading once you are finally in the game and as you progress further and further into the world moving around faster if you're quick enough you can actually make Jack fall over. I remember this happening once as a teen and not really understanding how or why it happened. So imagine my shock when it happened again. How did I just get Jack to trip? After looking it up, what I discovered was a cool little trick by the development team. What was going on here was the fact that when you trip, it gives the game just that little bit extra time to load up the game in front of you and therefore never break the immersion that you're in this open world, again, with no loading. It's tiny little details like this that keep this world completely alive. Sure, some of the missions are a tad pointless, but overall, it's a great experience that sold well enough to, of course, greenlight the second game. And in true Naughty Dog fashion, this sequel wasn't just going to be the same game with the same characters in a slightly different world, it was going to be something completely different. After being transported to a foreign world, wrongfully imprisoned, then tortured for two years, anyone would give up hope. Well, Almost anyone. Let's go take care of business. This world is better left to Jack. Rated team for team. Jack 2 was Naughty Dog's chance to use the already developed engine and push it even further. The graphical jump between Jack 1 and Jack 2, more noticeable in the HD remasters, really does look like generational jumps. No longer are characters sharp around the edges, they look smooth, they look more fluid and the world around them had come alive way more than before. However, for many, including myself, that jump from the cutesy lovable platformer with the great story to a Grand Theft Auto 3 clone was a tough pill to swallow. Now, as you know, these history videos don't really cover the story, it's more about the development and the gameplay, but for this one, let me just quickly recap. At the end of the first game, if you completed it 100%, you got to see the secret cryptic ending that showed a big portal-like thing, or at least that's what it looked like, and not much else happened. At the beginning of the second game, we continue right where we left off, where our heroes accidentally fill up the world with evil flying bats coming from that portal, and you fly into it, get captured, and for two years, get experimented on, turning you into an angry, talking, Sonic Unleashed Werehog-like character five years before the Werehog was even a thing. The end result is a game that's kind of a blend between Jack and Daxter and Grand Theft Auto 3, which of course was blowing up video game sales left, right, and center, and had plenty of copy tools. Yeah, at the time, I wasn't a fan of this change-up, and for the longest time, I just didn't give this game a chance. I wanted colourful, cute, fun platformers, goddammit, and I was in love with the original so much so that all other platformers that came out during that time, of which we had plenty, didn't hold up to the precursor legacy. But again, that's just me. 
Jack 2 Renegade, as it was known here in Europe, was such a huge departure that for the most part, when you speak to fans nowadays, they're either going to feel the same as I did, or they are really only going to like the Jack games from number 2 onwards, for the most part at least. Thankfully, in more recent years, I have given the game more time since I downloaded it on newer hardware, and I gotta say, I actually quite like it. Of course, nostalgia is always gonna prevail, but Jack 2 is a great game. The review scores for the time, let me tell you guys, they didn't lie. Thankfully, Jack feels pretty much identical to the original, but now you have guns and that dark Jack power up thing. Thankfully, unlike similar games that have done the same thing, I'm looking at you, Shadow the Hedgehog, the gunplay fits the moveset quite nicely in this game. You have a good amount of variety to the weapons, and it's obvious to see that this is still a platformer at heart. These abilities are really just extensions rather than massive genre-defining gameplay shifts, which is what I was honestly expecting for so many years. Still, the game is most definitely darker, and yes, you do hijack flying cars a whole lot more than you would ever expect after playing that original game, but again, it all works nicely within its platforming landscape. And that's the most important thing to take away from Jack 2. This isn't just another copycat of Grand Theft Auto 3. The team at Naughty Dog took what they liked about Grand Theft Auto 3 and injected it within the world of Jack and Daxter, making a pretty solid experience. The end result is a game that's not as fun to simply go around causing havoc and running away from the popo like in something like Grand Theft Auto 3, but what Naughty Dog did do was take the combat and story-driven elements of that game and, in my opinion, actually improve upon them. What I'm trying to say here is that it's very easy to see that the team had taken inspiration from Grand Theft Auto 3, but that's all they did. What they actually ended up doing was creating something incredibly unique, and they did that unique thing very, very well. Oh, and by the way, it's also worth pointing out that when Naughty Dog was looking for a voice actor for Jack, yes, he speaks now, they decided to go for a strong, almost incredible Hulk-like character for the role, for obvious reasons. And just before they put out the call for that voice actor, they discovered Mike Irwin, aka the teenage version of the Incredible Hulk from the 2003 movie, and that was that. <laughs> Add all of this with even more immersive music, incredible art direction, and some genuinely challenging missions that will test even the most hardcore of gamer, and you have a game that honestly, I really have grown to love. And with that game's success, of course, Jack Free came straight after. Well, Daxter, my old friend, it's finally over. We've answered the mystery of the Precursor Legacy, and we've defeated the last of our enemies. He's mine! The Epic Jack Trilogy is coming to its dramatic conclusion. Okay. Rest yeah! assured... It won't end like this. Just lift your foot and I'll kick your... Well, Jack, it's over. There's just one thing left to say. I am your father. What? I'm your father! Right, yeah. Listen to your feelings. You're not my father. No, seriously, your mother and I... The uh, Epic Jack trilogy is coming to its dramatic conclusion. Um, before you were born, obviously. Rest assured, it won't end like this. <laughs> Coming out only one year after Jack 2, this game is in fact more of the same. Unlike the jump between the first two games, Jack 3 very much continues on from the tried and tested formula from the second game. If that's what you want, then go and get it, because that's exactly what you're going to get. It's grittier, it's harder, it really is just Jack 2.5 to be quite frank. Thankfully, the mix-up in the gameplay styles do keep this one fresh, and the team was able to clean up a few things like the number of flying cars getting in your way and the very, very overused, and that's a good thing, Mad Max-like gameplay elements found between and even in some of the missions, where you drive a massive industrial buggy-like thing across massive desert-like areas. You got some awesome aerial combat gameplay in this game too, and once again, the character designs and animations are even better than before, although not quite the jump that 1 to 2 was. 
Who would have thought the lovable world of Jack 1 would turn into this evil Mad Max world within Jack 3? The biggest issue I have with the game is that I really do not see it as a game that's for newcomers. Sure, it does things to try and explain what happened in the previous titles, but I don't think it does it all that well. Depending on what game you played first out of the original two, then that's going to be the sort of game you want more of. Jack 3 is really only for people that want to complete the trilogy, which of course you should definitely do if you've played both of the previous entries, just don't expect the story to grip you quite as much as it did before. Which honestly didn't bother me all that much by this point, I just wanted another 7 or 8 hours of awesome Naughty Dog gameplay and with Jack 3, I got it. And then I got it again with Jack X. <laughs> That shrapnel just waiting to happen. Hey! Let's jack things up. I think we got a winner. Sweet, AC. Uh Jack X, rated T for team. Jack X is this series Kart Racer, and surprisingly, Jack X actually has a better storyline than Jack 3, but by this point, who cares? Similar to when Crash got his own kart racer during the production of Jack 3, it was decided that those big, heavy, buggy-like sections should be turned into their own game, resulting in something that's incredibly different than Crash Team Racing, or Mario Kart for that matter, but instead, what we have is a rather stunning combat racer. Heck, that was even the name of the game in North America, with huge roll cage-like vehicles at breakneck speed and a whole heap of weapons to take out the competition. Similar to those later Jack games, this Jack X game is not to be taken lightly. It is a hard game, harder than any platformer you've ever played in the series, and definitely harder than any Mario Kart game you've played. The margin for error in this game is extremely punishing. Getting to first place is only half the challenge when vehicles try and take you down, or more likely if you slightly mess up, the chances of you going down a few places is most probably going to happen. Still, that's what the game's about, learning the tracks as best as you can, saving your power-ups for the sections that you know very well, and continuing to learn the areas you're not so good at. And in true Naughty Dog fashion, it's not just about the racing. My biggest issue with Mario Kart is that it's racing, battle mode, I suppose, and nothing else. Whereas games like Sonic All-Star Racing, Wacky Racers, and of course Crash Team Racing have so many awesome challenges that give single-player gamers more reasons to play. And of course, you can be damn sure this game has a whole lot of that sort of stuff going on. Seriously, I'm not sure why more people do not bring this up when comparing games like that. I suppose the learning difficulty is a tad more extreme in this game, but still, it simply is just so, so good. Now, the music in the Jack games, up to this point, is completely forgettable. There's a couple of memorable drum-like tracks in some of the earlier games, but besides that, there's really nothing. It's way more forgettable than any of the competition. To be fair, that continues with Jack X. You don't really have any catchy platforming jingles that are going to earworm their way into your memory. But what it does have is possibly better, for a grown-up racer like this, that is. This game's soundtrack is a blend of high-octane rock tracks, including the incredible You Think I Ain't Worth a Dollar But I Feel Like a Millionaire by Queens of the Stone Age, and as for the rest of the soundtrack, god damn. Billy Howardell was brought in to work on the soundtrack due to Naughty Dog wanting to get more bands involved with the racing game, and if that name doesn't ring any bells, he was the lead guitarist and vocalist for the band A Perfect Circle. Because Billy was actually working on a new album at the time, he reluctantly took on the project and ended up turning it into a massive collaboration effort. They originally wanted 20 songs, all instrumentals, but there was no way I was going to be able to write 20 songs, nor would I want to. So I came up with the idea of doing four or five songs, then having 15 remixes done of those songs. So I farmed the stuff out to some people I trust, like Danny Lerner, formerly of Nine Inch Nails, who did a bunch of them. But he eventually hit a brick wall. 
so he started to write his own music, which the guys at Naughty Dog were jazzed about. I also had some done by Eric Bass from the band Shinedown, who is a musician friend of my best friend, and Dean Menta, who was one of the guitar players of Faith No More. John Fries, a Perfect Circle's ex-drummer, played the majority of the drums, but Adam Willard from The Offspring and Joey Castillo from Queens of the Stone Age played on some tracks as well. Also, Paz, a Perfect Circle's ex-bassist, played bass on a couple tracks. Troy, a Perfect Circle's guitarist, played guitar on a couple tracks, and Wes Borland, the guitarist for Limp Bizkit, also played guitar on a couple tracks. That's pretty insane, right? Sadly, even though talks of a Jack X vinyl release have been talked about, and even a small amount of either test prints, promo prints, or possibly even bootlegs have been pressed, this incredible soundtrack as of right now is staying in the game and that's that. And before we move into even more spin-offs in the world of Jack and Daxter, here's a couple of silly little factoids about Jack X. Upon release, Jack X actually infected a small amount of PlayStation 2 users who played the game on the original fat PlayStation 2. Because of this, Sony offered to repair any memory cards sent out that were affected by the game, which actually is a whole lot better than Jack X's HD release, which glitched upon first release by starting you off with no wheels. Yep, a racing game with no wheels. Thankfully, Sony fixed these issues with an update pretty quickly, but still, it's quite a funny glitch. For many, this is the true Jack and Daxter collection. Three games plus a spin-off kart racer by the original team. However, as you may or may not know, only one year after the release of Jack X, we got to play Jack and Daxter's first proper spin-off. Although I suppose this would be the second spin-off after Jack X. Regardless, in 2007, Ready at Dawn brought us the standalone title, Daxter. And guys, you should not neglect this game. Taking place between Jack's capture and eventual escape at the very beginning of the second game, this game fills in the Daxter gap. What was he up to during this time? Well, turns out, whilst looking for Daxter, he became a bug exterminator, and the results are actually really quite solid. You control Daxter, who does feel a fair bit different to Jack with his gun, or I suppose his critter spray, which can be used as a weapon as well as a way to move around the world, along with his electric fly swatter. Just like the original game, this is very collection heavy. And just like all of the games in the series, it's surprising just how many different gameplay change-ups there are in it to keep the game fresh. In fact, even though it came out after the original series, I would say that this is actually the perfect way to go from the cutesier original game compared to the more heavy-handed sequel. It also has quite a decent soundtrack too, arguably better than the originals, besides X. Overall, I was surprised at how good this game actually was. Was. Sure, it sold well and it became part of the greatest hit series because it sold 4.2 million units and the reviews were good for the time, but the most important thing is, 15 odd years later, the game still holds up. It's definitely worth checking out and trying to unlock the making of video by collecting everything in the game. Even though, in all honesty, what you do unlock is really more of a trailer for the game, which you just completed. Okay. The beauty of nature versus the evil of slugs. People cry out to me, John, I've tried all the really expensive slug slayers and nothing seems to bite. I'm desperate. That's because they haven't tried. Dexter! Humidity <laughs> 10 plus. Squirrel! I know that cat. You bugging, man. That ain't no cat. That's an ox. What the cashew is an ox? It's like when a weasel and an otter fall into a web of love. Like a mixed nut. <laughs> like when you had Forrest Fever for that skunk and she sprayed you nasty. You think Daxter has a sister? Yeah. I bet she's smoking like chestnuts on an open fire. Yo, I'd hit that. 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 Daxter for PSP. I'd hit that. 
Regarding actual gameplay developments, well, there isn't much out there that exists. All we do know is that some of the original team, or at least one team member, came from the original Jack and Daxter series. You also had some people from Blizzard that worked on StarCraft, but besides that, there's very little out there. Not only was this a great way for Sony to show off what the PSP could do, but more importantly, it gave the studio the ability to make a game far closer to the original title. With Daxter's OTT attitude, this was always going to be the case, especially with the rather oddball dream sequences that allowed for our hero to act like other heroes in several other movie spoofed mini games based within the world of The Matrix, Lord of the Rings, Indiana Jones, and Braveheart. Thankfully, the most important part about all of this is that these rather silly sections do not take away from the quality of the main game. We really set out to prove that you can do a game that is as good, if not better than a PS2 game and really show off the platform. If we do end up becoming the game that opens the floodgates, I'd be really, really proud because it's such an awesome handheld. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for the final game in the series. You see, whilst Ready at Dawn was working on the PSP exclusive Daxter game, Naughty Dog were working on yet another PSP game. Known back then as simply Jack PSP, the eventual Lost Frontier ended up becoming quite far removed from the game that it was originally intended to be. Naughty Dog was being well, Naughty Dog, they got the PS1 early and managed to completely obliterate that system with the Crash Bandicoot franchise. The same can also be said for the PlayStation 2 with the Jack and Daxter series, although of course not quite to the same level. And now the PlayStation 3 was on its way too. So just like before with Crash Team Racing, they split up putting one team on Jack X and eventually an even smaller team on Jack PSP, whilst the rest worked on yet another new property known then as simply Big, but of course, that would eventually become Uncharted Drake's Fortune. With so many projects going on at the same time, and one of them being Uncharted, which requires a whole heap more effort, yet again, they couldn't keep up. Which of course resulted in the barely started concept of Jack PSP getting passed over to another studio called High Impact Games. As you will soon see, retrospectively, this was not a wise move. But at the time, Naughty Dog had no choice. If you thought the jump between PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2 was hard, think again. The jump between PS2 and PS3 was going to be even harder. We were switching to brand new rendering technology with the extraordinarily complicated hardware architecture of the PS3 and literally building our entire code base up from scratch. Dozens of new proposals thrown out, months and months of tool work completely scrapped. And for three or four months straight, no fewer than one employee quitting every week as they lost hope we'd pull out of our slump. Now, all of that hardcore work put in by the team did eventually lead to us getting some of the greatest games of all time, the original Uncharted games and The Last of Us. However, for the time, it was yet another very, very sad moment for the team. Jack and Daxter had to move on. Now, High Impact Games are a decent enough company. In fact, the company also included members of the original Jack and Daxter development team, along with some people from Insomniac 2. Regardless, this team got the game extremely early on. One level was created and one cutscene by Naughty Dog, hardly anything else besides the basic story and some concept art. Unfortunately, this didn't leave a lot for the team to work with. And although the game, which is widely panned by the way, did try its best to continue on Naughty Dog's original vision, I don't think it's fair to say that all of the blame can lie with them. Why? Because story elements brought in by Naughty Dog were hated by the masses, and story elements brought in by High Impact were hated even more. For the most part, Naughty Dog was really hands-off during development. They would pop in from time to time, but other than that, we mostly just did our own thing. They were busy with Uncharted, and we had to make the game in a short amount of time compared to the other two games we made, so some sections feel rushed. Sadly, it really was a bad way for this series to end its life. It had a broken story, it had an even worse engine that, quite frankly, couldn't even compete with the game engine from the original game that was released eight years prior. Again, I'm sure that with more time, the levels could have become more interesting and perhaps they could have fixed the story a little bit, but honestly, <laughs> 
I don't know. It just feels like a chore to play this game, something that the Jack and Daxter series, no matter what version you pick up, has never been about. Here's what Sam Thompson from Naughty Dog has to say about the game. At the time, it looked like High Impact Games was going to be able to do a pretty good job with it. I don't want to say anything disparaging of them. I like the guys at High Impact. But if we had to do it all over again, we would have done some things differently in the execution of The Lost Frontier. I'm not happy with that being Jack's swan song. I think we could have done a lot better. Over the years, the original games have been re-released several times as collections, all of which besides the PlayStation Vita release, which is way more broken than it should be, play well enough for newcomers to enjoy. Of course, the original PlayStation 2 releases are still the best, according to the hardcore fans, but personally, I am enjoying the PlayStation 4 slash PlayStation 5 downloads, and so far, so good. Besides these collections and the cameos found within other games, primarily Naughty Dog's own Uncharted titles, the only real final tale to tell is that of the cancelled Jack and Daxter 4 game, which was to be created before the days of yet another legendary game that at the time was codenamed Thing, aka The Last of Us. This game spent about a year in pre-development and was to be a far more serious and grown-up approach to the already serious and grown-up approach that the series had jumped from since the first game. Concept art shows an almost lifelike Jack and with a far more realistic rodent Daxter in a fantasy-like world that looks like it's been ripped straight from an Alice in the Looking Glass movie. It's fair to say that this is obviously still a Jack and Daxter game at heart, but it had pushed itself so far away with its concept art that it barely resembled it anymore. As always, it's exciting to think about what this game could have been, but of course, it was probably for the best. Releasing a new game that looked this realistic would have done the fans a disservice, a conclusion they came up to themselves. Thankfully, all this was not lost as the game did eventually plant the seeds for The Last of Us, and I'm sure you will all agree that Naughty Dog definitely made the right choice with that one. It's never off the table. It's not too much time passing, but it's the same issues we explored with the Jack game. Is it something that makes sense to us now? I mean, we still have people that worked on the Crash games in the studio. We never forget our past, and it'd be great for nostalgic reasons. It'd be the same reason that there isn't a Jack 4. I don't know if it's playing to our strengths right now. And besides that, nothing major or concrete has ever really happened. All in all, over the course of six main games and a few compilations, one game and one compilation were below average. The rest? Well, they were of course good enough to create one of the most hardcore loyal fan bases PlayStation 2 gamers have ever seen. And for good reason. Naughty Dog are one of PlayStation's absolute top first-party studios, unrivaled when it comes to the sort of hardcore story-driven action adventures that they are known for, and when it comes to the racers, well, depending on who you ask, they may even rival the best in the business. Jack and Daxter, the original Jack and Daxter games, at the very least, show an enormous step forward for the studio. The perfect in-between franchise with Crash Bandicoot on one end and Uncharted and The Last of Us on the other. It's fair to say that the end isn't necessarily upon us when it comes to these games, and to be fair, it is a real shame that the game ended on such a massive downgrade compared to everything else that came before it. But besides that, if we never got anything else, then I would be more than happy slapping the close sign on this franchise, which offers more than enough diverse gameplay styles within its trilogy and two half lifespan that few other IPs can replicate. When you look back at platformers from this generation within the world of Sony, you really only have two big first party franchises to choose from, Jack and Daxter and Ratchet and Clank. The later has had more of a revival in recent years of its movie and its PlayStation 5 sequel slash remake of sorts, and now with the talk of Tom Holland aka Nathan Drake from the Uncharted movie, along with Ruben Fletcher, the director of said movie, both showing interest in making a Jack and Daxter movie adaption, the future is bright, even if that future includes no more games 
because let's face it, the originals are still very much the best. Hey there guys. Thank you all so, so much if you made it this far into the video. Now, before you go ahead, if you haven't hit that subscribe button yet, please do hit that subscribe button uh, and the notification bell because the subscribe, the subscribe button isn't enough apparently. Uh, but that out of the way, uh, before I say all the thanks to all of my Patreons and YouTube members, I've got to give some extra big thank yous to, well, obviously to Naughty Dog for making these incredible games. I've wanted to make this video for so long. I'm such a big fan of this series and um, especially that first game. And uh, yeah, hopefully uh, I did the series proud. So thank you, Naughty Dog. Um, shout out to, 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 to channels like Boomer Streams, Power Cell Zeke, uh, the Jack and Daxter Archive. You can go and check out links to all of those, including other resources that I've used and uh, uh, all that sort of stuff down below. And also, let's also give a massive shout out to Antdu, JJ McCullough, uh, uh, L Supersonic Q, Alpha Omega Sin, Vetus Varnes, one of my patrons. Thank you, mate. Uh, Scarfulu, uh, Quinton Reviews, and Stop Skeletons from Fighting, all who provided voice um, uh, their voice talents for this video. You guys have helped make this into a, a mammoth project. I've really enjoyed making this, although I don't want to play another Jack and Daxter game for a good couple of years now. It's been too... Uh, I, I, all I've been doing recently is like focusing everything on Jack and Daxter. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy to close that door just for a little while because I am knackered. <laughs> I've heard too much. I've heard too much. Um, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video though. I've put a lot of effort into this. So like I said, the best way to support me is obviously to subscribe and hit that bell. But um, if you do want to go the extra mile and you want to support the channel, uh, you can do so like these awesome people that you see across the bottom of the screen right here. These are all the patrons and YouTube members that support me. Let's give some extra shout outs to those people with an extra big shout out going to Boots and Pup, Jeremy Bauer, The Sneaky Ferret, King of Carrot Flower, Ray Blair, Vitas Varnes, Agro Crag, James, Michael Ridley Dash, The Action Saxon, Christopher Devero, Roll VP, Jay is Manchild, Clan Bob, Mike Fallon, Nicholas Burtner, Taylor Rainwater, um, Chev Matic, Jabba Al Aden, Benjamin Guy, Man Shovel, Chris the Shapeshifter, Aaron Gorman, Big Rico, Richard Aldajik, Shadow Dragon, Wobbles and Bean, The Wonder Ducks, Game Apologist, Dina, Lucas Softel, Intrigued Gaming, Ye Old Hamburglar, Jeff Mianowski, Solitz Captor, Roven Army, Jeremy Rodriguez, Tim Lunn, Nick Pollard, Bram Perez, Gary Pinkett, Coron uh, Conrad Constantine, Andrew Dalton, Retro to Next Gen, aka Lou, King Link Reviews, Todd Paul Float G, That Gamer, Over Joel Zane, Akatina, Timo84, um, Italki, Teacher, The Ashen Knight, Sir Nilsson, Shade Silence, Matt Jackson, Josh Gibbons, Ian Quell, Arista, Dina81, Mind of the Unsane, Vikeko, and The Cunning Linguist. Thank you all so, so, so much for your support. Like I say, I love making these videos and the fact that you guys stick around. If you're, if you're this far into the video, massive, massive uh, thumbs up to you people there. I'm exhausted. I need to D Jack and D Jack and Dax the detox myself. I don't know. I was trying to be clever there. Jack and detox myself. That was why I was going with it. Because I am knackered from everything Jack and Daxter. I'm going to go chill out and uh, that's the end of that. So much love to you all. Thank you for supporting the channel. And until next time, guys, this is DJ Slope signing out and hopefully I'll see you all next time. Bye bye. <laughs>